story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. Well, now, I'm going to be talking about this book. It's a book that will make you wise, but not clever. There are plenty of other books you can read to make you clever, but this book, and this is the only book to do it, will make you wise. And I'd rather be wise than clever. Clever, you make a lot of money. Wise, you make the most of life. Now, people read this book in different ways. Some people use what I call the medicinal method. Ten verses a day keeps the, by the devil away, kind of thing. But other people use devotional notes, and I have the sneaky feeling that they study the notes more than they study the book, and that they read through the selected passage quickly and then study the notes on it. How did God mean us to read his word? Well, I want to begin by telling you that this word Bible originally is a plural word, not a single, singular word. It's the word Biblia, and it means books. And this is a collection of books. It's a library. There are different kinds of books here. There are songs, there are proverbs, there are history books, there are prophetic books. And it's terribly important that we read the Bible book by book. You see, somebody has damaged our Bibles very badly. They have put chapter and verse numbers in it. And many Christians have become text people. And we quote John 3.16. And I'm always quoting Hezekiah 3.16. And I make that say whatever I like, and I see people hunting through their Bible <laughs> to try and find Hezekiah 3.16. It's not there. And uh, somebody, somebody who'd listened to my tapes for a long time said, David, why is it you're supposed to be a Bible teacher, but you never give chapter and verse numbers? I say, no, they're not part of the Word of God, and God never intended them to be there. It has divided up God's Word in a way that he never intended. What other book would you read in which every sentence was numbered? Well, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? So here we have a collection of different books. And we need to ask of each book, what kind of a book is it? Why was it written? What's it all about? Now, I've written a book called Normal Christian Birth, and to my surprise, when it was published, it's about being born again and how to help people into the new birth. But to my surprise when it came out, the British Library in the front has catalogued it under childbirth. <laughs> and so now, if you want to get this book in your public library, you'll have to get it in the section under gynecology. <coughs> Wouldn't it be crazy to go to your library and take out a book of gardening if you want to know about cooking? Or to take out a novel if you want to study computers? And yet people pick texts from all over the Bible without any regard to context, without asking where they're finding it, and they say, this is the Word of God. A classic example of that is the text, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now what kind of thing is that about? I often ask a congregation, what kind of thing can you do through Christ? And they tell me, witness, heal, pray. I say, but that text has nothing whatever to do with those things. It's about being able to live on your income. And it's a very, very relevant text today. And Paul says, I've learned to be content whether I've got a lot of money or a little money. I've learned how to manage. And you know, I found recently in one church, two-thirds of the congregation were in debt and needed to learn the meaning of that text. I can manage on my salary. I can manage on my wages through Christ who strengthens me. I can manage on my pension. Very relevant. But you see, if you take the text out of its context, you lose its meaning altogether. And the book in which a text occurs is the major context of that verse and gives it its whole meaning. Now we're going to begin with the Gospels. They are a unique kind of book. In the New Testament we've got history books, we've got letters, we've got one prophetic book, but we have four books which are quite unique. There's nothing quite like them in any other literature, and we call them Gospels. Now what is a Gospel? 
it's not a biography. It's certainly not an autobiography because Jesus never wrote any books. But it's not a straight biography either because over one third of the pages of each gospel describe the death of Jesus. Now I don't know of any other biography that spends a third of its pages on someone's death, however spectacular or tragic the death may have been. So what is a gospel? The nearest thing I can get to it in modern life is this, it is a news bulletin. It's a news announcement and when you read them you get the sense straight away that there's an exciting bit of news to share and that really it should be read aloud. And I suggest that even when you're by yourself, by yourself you might get more out of it by reading it aloud to yourself. Reading it aloud to others you get far more out of it. As I've found, I love reading the Bible to people even more than preaching because when I'm reading the Bible every word is worth hearing. When I'm preaching that's not quite true. So it's a unique literary form and the writers of the Gospels were witnesses of something. They actually saw something happen, they heard it happen and they want to announce it as news to others. So really a Gospel is an extended news bulletin. That's how it came about. But as the time passed, obviously these witnesses to what Jesus did and said were getting fewer and fewer as they died off, as they were killed off. But at the same time the church was getting bigger and bigger and spreading further and further. So here was a conflict. The number of those who could announce the news, who had seen it firsthand, was getting smaller and the number of people who needed to hear this news bulletin were getting bigger. So what was to be done? The answer is they had to write it down quickly and get it down in black and white before they passed away so that we've got this first-hand account of Jesus from these people. Now the first thing that strikes you when you open your Bible is that there are four Gospels. Now why four? Wouldn't it be much more convenient if we only had one? And I'm sure when you read them you realise there's an awful lot of overlap between them. So why four? Why couldn't God get them together and say produce one volume and each of you contribute all that you know and let's have it all together? And there have been attempts to do this. One of my favourite authors years ago was a man called Freeman Wills Croft. Any of you fans of his? Especially when I lived in Guildford, I enjoyed reading the crime at Guildford. It's a murder on the hog's back. And uh, <laughs> Freeman Wills Croft was an Anglican lay reader living in Guildford in Surrey and he wrote detective novels. He was also interested in railways, which I share with him, but he decided to put the four Gospels into one story and he did this and there's Freeman Wills Croft's Harmony of the Gospels. It's an inge ingenious thing to do but it's lost something and I never read it nowadays. I enjoyed it at first and I thought that's going to save me a lot of time. Instead of reading all four I can read it all in one and then I realised he'd lost a valuable dimension. You see, God duplicates certain things in Scripture. There are two accounts of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. There are two accounts of the history of Israel in Chronicles and Kings and here we have four accounts of Jesus' life and death. So why? The answer is for some important things God has to give us a different angle and to get the full picture you need every angle. Sometimes it's a two-dimensional picture but with Jesus we've got a four-dimensional picture. We see him from four quite different angles. Now I've not been in prison but I'm told that if I was I would have to have my photograph taken like this and like this. But when I said that a month ago, a man who had been through that experience corrected me. He said they now do three mug shots, as he said, to get a full picture of someone's face so that he can really be recognised. Well, one of my favourite machines is Concorde. I just love the shape of that aircraft. It looks as if it's flying even when it's on the ground. There's something about that shape. Now, how would you describe that shape to someone in words? It would be quite a task, wouldn't it? 
Well, one way you simply describe it as a delta shape. And people understand that as a delta. That's the shape of the Greek letter D or delta. That's why it's called that. But then when you look at, look at it like that, what shape is it now? And in fact, if you wanted to take photographs of the shape of Concord to show someone, you'd have to take at least four or five, or they'd never understand the shape of the thing. It looks so amazing from every angle. Well now, G's the most amazing character ever lived. And so God inspired four people to look at him for us and to write down what they saw. Now, it's an easy thing to say that each of them saw a different person, or rather the same person in a different manifestation or attribute. And it's become customary to say that Mark saw Jesus as the Son of Man. He wrote the first gospel and the briefest, and then Matthew came along with the second and saw the King of the Jews. Luke wrote the third to be written and saw the Saviour of the world, and John the fourth, and he saw the Son of God. Well, that's quite a neat way of saying there were four different angles. But we need to dig a bit deeper than that. There are two aspects that we need to look at. Number one, the writer. Oh, I'm jumping ahead. Let's just uh, go through that middle bit. Three stages in writing up the life of a man who's now dead. The first publications usually tell us what the man did. The obituary in the Times tell us what he did. That's the first interest people have in a great person who's gone, what they did. But after a bit, people get more interested in what he said. And they begin to publish his letters and his speeches. But then you'll find a third stage of biography comes when people want to dig behind all that, to what the man was, his character, his personality, what motivated him, what made him tick, what was he really like. And the four Gospels actually follow these three stages very significantly. Mark is simply concerned with what Jesus did, his actions, his miracles, and his death and resurrection. Matthew and Luke both have far more about what Jesus said. They've recorded his preaching very much more than Mark ever did. That's why they're both longer, because they both used Mark as their basic outline, but then fed into it a whole lot of new material. John, however, was not interested in what Jesus was, sorry, what he did. He was more interested in what he said, but his supreme concern, as we'll see in the next talk, was with what Jesus was. Who was he? His personality, his innermost being. Who was he? Now let's come to this third part. There are two levels at which you can study a gospel. One is from the point of view of the writer. What did he see? How did he understand it? His insight is different from the other three. So what was his insight into Jesus? Because insight is more revealing than sight. But that's only one angle. The other angle at which you need to study a gospel is from the reader's angle. And here we must ask, what was the intention behind the writing of this book? Who was it written for? Why was it written? Because the writer wasn't just getting things off his chest and just telling us what he saw. He was writing for a particular purpose and particular readers. And so whenever we study a gospel, we need to come at it from these two angles. The writer's angle and the reader's angle. The writer's insight and his intention. Who was he hoping to reach? What was he hoping to teach? Well now, I hope that will just lay the foundation for the rest of our study. We're going to just look at Matthew now from these two angles. We call the first three Gospels the synoptic Gospels. You must have heard that term. It's made up of two Greek words, syn, together, and optic, see, view. And it says these three Gospels have a similar view. They view Jesus together 
whereas John, he's just one on his own. And you must have noticed what a difference there is when you leave Matthew, Mark and Luke and get into John. Let's begin with Mark. Mark is a very exciting piece of journalism. It's sheer journalism, this news announcement. And he rushes through the first months of Jesus' public ministry, but he divides it very carefully into two and a half years and half a year. That's his framework. And it's a framework that Matthew and Luke were both going to use. Thirty months Jesus ministered up in the north in Galilee, which was a very cosmopolitan area. Lots of different nationalities were there, a very open country and open people. But in Judea in the south were the nationalists, very narrow people, very strict people, very isolated people. And Jesus was very popular in the north and very unpopular in the south. That's why he died in the south, not in the north. The only people who tried to kill him in the north were his own villagers in Nazareth, tried to throw him off a cliff. But on the whole, in the north, Jesus was immensely popular. Thousands followed him. When he went to the south, that's when he ran into trouble again and again. So that's the framework. And Mark is building up to a climax in this, and the climax is in the south. There's a kind of leisurely feel about the north, but when you get into the south, the whole thing tightens up and becomes a crisis. Now, in another way, he's not only building up to a climax, he's also slowing down to it. And in the first few pages of Mark, you're rushing through the months, and straightway, and straightway, in fact, you rush through two and a half years in a few pages, and straightway he got into a boat, and immediately he was at the other side. Must have been a jet boat or something, but... And immediately, everything's happening immediately. Have you ever noticed that? It's journalism, getting you all excited about everything that was going on. But then the years become months. The next few months, a few pages, and then the months become weeks. And the weeks become one week. And each day is described. And then on the last day, every hour is described. Did you ever notice that? It's like an express train slowing up and coming to a halt, and it halts right in front of the cross. So Mark is building everything up towards the cross and slowing everything down towards the cross. Do you see that combination of building up and slowing down? It's a masterly piece of journalism, and it's probably the best gospel to give a complete outsider to read who just knows nothing about Jesus and wants to know about this exciting person we believe in. Now let's turn straight away to Matthew. We're not looking at Mark now. Matthew uses Mark as his framework, but he has changed it very considerably. First, he's made it much bigger in size. He has added a great deal. He's added all the story of his birth, of his conception, of the wise men coming. You know all the story from Christmas. Now, none of that is in Mark. Mark began his story when Jesus was 30, but Matthew goes way back and adds a whole lot of things. So he starts earlier. He makes a lot of alterations. We'll look at those when we come to them. But he actually changes things in Mark to bring out another aspect. He puts the story of the lost sheep in a completely different context, so that the lost sheep is no longer a sinner, but is a backsliding Christian. He omits a great deal, but above all, he collects the sayings of Jesus. There's a lot more speech in Matthew, and these sayings are collected into sermons, of which there are five big sermons in Matthew. And the best known is the first, the Sermon on the Mount. But there are four others. And Matthew is unusual in this. Luke, when he wrote his Gospel, didn't do that. He scattered the sayings of Jesus all the way through the narrative. But Matthew collected them under five themes, which we shall look at in a moment. And he did that for a specific purpose. There were probably sayings that Jesus had said separately, but Matthew said, I'm going to gather them together in five blocks. 
Now Matthew was Jewish and the law of Moses was collected in five blocks. The five first books of the Bible, we call them the Pentateuch, which means the five books. The five books of Moses, the five sermons of Jesus. What's Matthew saying? He's saying there's a new law come. It's not the law of Moses anymore, it's the law of Jesus now. Again, we'll come back to that. The structure is very interesting. He alternates words with deeds, has a block of the words of Jesus, then he has a block of the deeds, then another block of the words, then another block of the deeds, and five times he switches. And so you've got a sandwich, you can see the structure of Matthew in your mind. Five sermons, each followed by five accounts of the deeds that Jesus did which illustrate his sermon. Because you see, Jesus was communicating in word and deed, as we should be communicating the gospel in word and deed. People should see and hear, and that's what Matthew is saying. Mark didn't say it, Mark invites us to come and see what Jesus did, but Matthew says, come and hear what he said and see what he did. And he keeps alternating like this, and having got the five-layer sandwich, he then puts the birth story in front and the death and resurrection after, and we've got his gospel. So we can see how he put it together. Now one of the things that does strike us when we read Matthew's Gospel is that it's very Jewish and it is obviously aimed at Jewish readers. Let's start with a very simple observation. No Jew likes to say God. They are so afraid of taking the name of the Lord in vain that I have never been able to persuade a Jew to tell me how to say Yahweh which I understand is the Hebrew name for God. And you know, I, I've tried to catch them out, I've said, how do you pronounce the name of God? And they say, yep, and then they stop, they say, you're not going to catch me out, and they won't say it. They are desperately afraid of taking the name of the Lord in vain, and therefore they prefer to say heaven instead of God. They say, heaven help you, pray to heaven, heaven bless you. And that is why in Matthew's Gospel you don't find the phrase Kingdom of God as you do all the way through Luke. When Matthew reports Jesus, he reports him as saying Kingdom of Heaven. And that would be a sensitivity towards Jewish readers to say Kingdom of Heaven. If you buy the Jewish Chronicle, you'll never find the word God in it. But you do find frequently a funny capital G and then a little dash, and then a little d. If ever you've read the Jewish Chronicle, you'll find gd all over it. And that's God, you know it's God, but they dare not spell it out fully in case they take his name in vain. So Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. That tells you he's thinking about Jewish readers, because Matthew, remember, saw Jesus as king of the Jews. And that's a great message that comes all the way through. Now there are other things that tell us that Matthew had Jewish readers in mind. One is that he refers to the Old Testament more than any of the other Gospels. And one of his favourite sayings is that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. And that phrase alone occurs 13 times in the story of Jesus' birth. And he quotes altogether, Micah, Hosea, Jeremiah and Isaiah, just in the birth story. He's saying something. One of the reasons why Matthew is first in the New Testament, even though it wasn't written first, is that it links with the Old Testament better than all the others. And it seems to provide a continuity. If you've read through the Old Testament and you're steeped in that, then you're just ready for Matthew and see the Old Testament fulfilled in Matthew. There are altogether 29 direct quotations from the Old Testament in this book, but there are 121 references indirect, allusions, 121. Here's a man who's steeped in the Old Testament scriptures. It's why he takes such 
a long time explaining that Jesus was born in Bethlehem because the prophets had said, O oh, Bethlehem of Judea, you're the one that's going to produce the king. And so Matthew emphasizes Bethlehem more than any other. You know, once when Jesus was preaching, somebody in the crowd said, could this be the Messiah? And somebody else answered and said, it can't be, he comes from Nazareth. And I'm amazed Jesus kept quiet. It, I couldn't have done, could you? <laughs> I'd have wanted to shout out, you're wrong, he's not from Nazareth, he's from Bethlehem. But Jesus kept that quiet. But Matthew writing for Jewish readers says he came from Bethlehem and I want you to know. That's why he included the story of the birth, so that Jews would know he was fulfilling the prophets. Then of course, why was he crucified? That's the big problem to Jews. They cannot understand a king who lets himself be crucified. And Matthew makes it absolutely clear that Jesus was innocent. Keeps emphasizing it. He will not let Jewish readers think that Jesus was guilty of blasphemy and put to death as a criminal and as a man who broke God's law. And there is also a big emphasis in Matthew, as there isn't in any other gospel, on Jesus did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. And one of the strongest statements in Matthew, which has been a problem to Christians ever since, is Jesus said not one jot or one tittle of the law will pass away. Now, that makes me feel guilty because I'm breaking the law of Moses right now. And I usually do so because uh, a Jewish family helps me to. See, one of the jot or tittles of the Mosaic law is that you mustn't wear suits of mixed material. And St. Michael is my patron saint. <laughs> and it's a Jewish family who helps me to break that law. So, hey, what does Jesus mean? One jot or one tittle? That's going to be a problem we'll have to wrestle with. See, there's another law that if you get dry rot in your house, you've got to burn your house down out of love for your neighbor. <laughs> Doesn't say anything about the rentical man. You burn your house down because you love your neighbor. Then it says if you put an extension on your house and it has a flat roof, you've got to put a railing around the flat roof to stop the neighbor's children climbing up and falling over. That's a good one, isn't it? But there are building regulations, there are regulations about clothes and about your toilet arrangements. And Jesus says, not one jot or one tittle of the law will pass. It's Matthew who tells us this. It must have been a relief to the Jews because the Jews thought Jesus had come to destroy the law. Matthew said he didn't. He came to get it fulfilled. Well, it means we've got to wrestle with the laws of Moses. And yet having said all this, that Matthew is very much inclined to Jewish readers, I must now tell you that it's also for Gentile readers. And there's quite a bit of anti-Jewish teaching in Matthew. And Matthew has a lot going for the Gentiles, the wise men coming to see the baby in Bethlehem. We presume, though we're not sure, we presume that they were Gentiles. And right through to the end of the Gospel where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the Gentiles, all the nations, all the ethnic groups out there, all the non-Jews, go and make disciples of them. So Matthew is not just writing for Jewish readers, as many people have thought. And I've heard many say Matthew is the Gospel for Jews. No, it isn't. It's the most helpful one to give to a Jew. And I remember meeting a Jew who was converted through reading Matthew chapter 1. Would you believe it? That's the genealogy, all the begats, you know? When I first read through the Bible, I thought they did nothing but begat in those days, you know? <laughs> begat, 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 all the way through, whole chapters of begatting. And there we've got it, Matthew chapter 1, all the begatting, Jesus' family tree. And you know, this Jew was converted because when he read that, he suddenly realized Jesus was a real person. And that's what convinced him, because to a Jew, it's your family tree that establishes you as a person. And he was converted and believed in Jesus from just Matthew chapter 1. So the genealogies have their purposes. But here we have in this Gospel a chapter full of woes on Jews. 
Now, I wonder if you know what the word woe means. It's a curse. It's the opposite of the word blessed. And Jesus uttered as many woes as blesseds. Whenever I go to the Sea of Galilee, I always remember the woes of Jesus for this reason. If you go to Israel today, you will stay in a hotel on the shores of Tiberias. Not this week, because I've just heard that the hotels are all flooded with water. The Sea of Galilee has just risen like that. All the snow that's come and melted from Hermon, and the hotels are flooded. And they thought the Sea of Galilee would take four more years to fill up again. It's now all over the place. But you would stay in Tiberias. Do you know why? See, in Jesus' day, there were 250,000 people living on the shores of Galilee in four major cities, quarter of a million. It was the most populated area. So, you know, when tourists today see it, they say, oh, isn't it beautiful? I see it just as Jesus saw it, the green hills and, you know, that sheer romanticism. There were quarter of a million people living around that lake. Where are they? Where are the towns? The answer is this, Jesus said, Woe to you, Capernaum. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Woe to you, Chorazin. And they've all disappeared. The only town he never cursed was Tiberias, and it's still there. I tell you, when Jesus curses, that's something to make you tremble. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus cursed Jews. He said, Woe to you who love to have the chief seats in the synagogue. Woe to you that you like people to call you father and teacher. Woe to you. It's chapter 23 and it's just packed with woes against Jews. So Matthew's being an honest reporter at least. Even if he's writing for Jews, he tells them the truth as Jesus saw it about Jews. Before we leave this side, before we forget the Jewish side for a moment, why would Matthew write so strongly for the Jews? Because the time, by the time he wrote, the church was becoming more and more Gentile and a deep gulf was opening up between Jews and the church. And in fact, by the year AD 85, which would be just after Matthew wrote, by the year AD 85, Christians were being excommunicated from the synagogues. Jewish believers were no longer allowed to worship in a synagogue and the split had come. I remember I got into serious trouble once for saying that neither Abraham nor Moses would be eligible for Israeli citizenship today and there was a dead hush, but it's true. If you are Jewish, you can be an atheist, an agnostic, a Buddhist, anything you like, and you can be a citizen of Israel. But if you're a Jewish believer in Jesus, you can't. And Abraham and Moses both believed in Jesus, as did Elijah, and they wouldn't be eligible for Israeli citizenship. And this is because a great gulf opened up between Jew and Gentile believers and between the Jews and the Church of Christ. Because you see, the Church was Jewish in the beginning, all the Apostles were Jewish, all the first members were Jewish, and so Matthew is writing for Jewish readers just about the time that split was becoming permanent. Why would he do that? Well, two reasons I can give you. First, he wanted to keep the door open to Jews wanted to keep the relationship with Jews. He was a Jew. They were his people and Jesus was and is a Jew. And he wanted to keep that door open so that Jews would not feel that they had to keep away from the church. He had a real longing, as Paul had, that the Jews should come to believe in their own Messiah. But the other reason I believe he particularly wrote a gospel that would appeal to Jewish people was this. I believe he wanted Christians never to forget their Jewish roots. And Matthew of all Gospels roots Jesus in Judaism, roots him back in Jewish history, gives us his genealogy back to Abraham and David 
And so he's saying to Jews on the one hand, don't run away from Christians, and he's saying to Christians on the other hand, don't run away from Jews. And somehow this Gospel brings Jew and Christian together, always has done, and it's played a unique role in that particular task. Well, we'll have a little break now, and then I want to talk to, to you about the value of Matthew's Gospel for us Christians. I'm a Gentile, looking round, I think most of you here are Gentile believers. I'm sometimes mistaken for a Jewish believer <laughs> for obvious reasons. It runs in the family, but uh, nevertheless I'm Gentile, and yet Matthew is a favourite Gospel. What has it got to say to us? Well, we'll see in the next talk.